Tonight I want to share with us a very captivating topic which I'll call how to deal with the two most common forces of darkness in the life of a believer. You know, um, I was telling someone, see, we are Christians, and we are Christians because we have been born again. We have been saved. We have received the eternal life. That means we have been saved into a real kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom of the dear son of God, Jesus Christ. That's the kingdom of light. We were delivered from the domain, the kingdom of darkness. Now, one thing that will come out clearly there, that the life of being born again is a real life. Just as the life of not being born again is still real. Now, when we were born again, we were brought into a real kingdom, which is under the real God. Therefore, that tells us that out there we have a real devil, a demon with his real world. And he's looking for whom to devour or looking to attack the believer or those who are not conscious um, about their spiritual awakening. Now, as believers, therefore, we are in a battle. And this battle is not necessarily the battle against the devil, but a battle to maintain what Jesus has obtained for us. And now, when we are maintaining what Jesus has obtained for us, eternal salvation eternal prosperity, eternal life, and uh, the glorious life of grace. We need to know that the enemy will try to plant his evil seeds in our way of faith or in our path of faith so that maybe, peradventure, in so doing, he may have an occasion for fall or to fall for a believer. And those are things that he uses to condemn believers, to hold them back, to short circuit or jeopardize their work of faith. All this is in the quest of distracting the believer from living a victorious uh, life of salvation. But now, uh, there are several obstacles or common forces in the path of a believer that hinder them, force of darkness. But I want to narrow down tonight for just two. And these are, in my perception, they are the two main that um, hamper Christians, uh, obstruct believers, stand in their way of faith, and in a great way become a huge obstacle in their path of salvation. Now, the first one I want us to deal with is the spirit of disobedience. The force of the spirit of disobedience. Now, disobedience is defying. When you say someone is disobedient, it means that person is defying the instruction in spite of the repercussion. Now, disobedient means uh, it is a state whereby someone knows the repercussion of not following a particular set of instruction, but they do it anyway. Now, this is not as someone who is ignorant of um, a law or a rule that is set. For example, a line may be drawn here or a barrier may be put here, and now you are told, please don't cross here. Now, if you did not know, you were never there when the instruction was given, and now you bam the line, you are not disobedient you are ignorantly walking against the set down rules. So you are an ignorant person. Now, but there's that person who knows, they say don't cross this line, and whoever will cross this line shall be punished, or is punishable, or shall suffer some repercussion or consequences. And then you go ahead and cross that line, then you are walking in disobedience. So disobedience is defying the instructions in spite of the repercussions. You don't mind, you don't care about what repercussions will be, or it doesn't bother you what repercussions will be. You just um, do what you need to do anyway, inasmuch as you are defying or the set-down rules or the orders uh, that are given to you. Now, in the word of God, disobedience is not only a defiance of the instruction, but is a spiritual force. In the word of God, it's not just a defiance of the law or the set down rules. According to God's word, disobedience is a spiritual force. That means disobedience is birthed from a spiritual realm. Now, when you see people walk in defiance of the set down rules, regardless of the repercussions, then you know that these people are under a spell or they are under 
a dominion or they are under a manipulation or a control of another force. And this force is a spiritual force. Because according to the word of God, in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, when I read verse number 1 to 2, you see clearly that there is a force of disobedience that has held many people under its domain. He says, as for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. Then verse number 2, he says, he's talking to the Ephesian church. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. He says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who now is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now, he tells us something there. That disobedience is not only defying the law or the set down rule. It's actually walking under the dominion or the domain of a spiritual force. And now that's why we are saying that disobedience is not only defying the law, but rather is a spiritual force. Now having said that, then we can clearly see that disobedience opens doors to those who disobey. It actually opens doors for distractions. It opens doors for persecution or oppression. It is a force that opens doors into a life of a believer that brings in distraction, brings in oppression. Now this spirit, which the Bible tells us is working under the dominion of the kingdom of whose ruler is the prince, the kingdom, the king of the air. Now, living under disobedience or being disobedient is actually living under the rulership of the kingdom of the air. Now, this is a territorial spirit. When you talk about the kingdom of the air, we are talking about a set down um, governmental rulership that is ordained and run by the himself, Lucifer. That's why the Bible tells us in the book of um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 12, for we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. See, these are the rulers, the kingdom of the air. Now, these are satanic forces that will ensure that people live in defiance with set down rules. Because they know any time you obey God's word, you create a definite future. You walk in prosperity. You walk in victory. But now, they come in to interject in your course of life and always make you defiant to God's instruction, defiant to God's word. Now, this is one thing that every believer is facing. Paul says, I am torn in betwixt that the things that I want to do, they are not the things that I do. And the things that I do, they are not the things that I want to do. Then he says, oh, wretched me, who is bound in this earthly body. Now, he was talking from a perspective of, um, of humanity. That many a times we find that we are pushed by the urge of this fleshly body or our earthly body to doing the things that are contrary to the will of God. Now, this is what we talk about, the force of the spirit of disobedience. Now, it's at work. It was working in every believer, in every human being. But until you got born again, that's when you are set off the latches of the spirit of disobedience. Now, as I've said, we need to beware. Those who live in the spirit of disobedience, you are actually living under the domain, the rulership of the kingdom of the air, the prince of the air. Now, disobedience here is not necessarily only about the bigger things of God. You may find that it's so subtle in our day-to-day -day activities. A simple thing as being given an instruction. For example, you went to church on a Sunday morning. And while you are there, uh, one small usher, a young lady, maybe uh, 4.5 feet tall, just slender, and maybe just a college girl. Now you are coming there, you are the whole you uh, in your full regalia with all the authority that you think you have. Now this young girl tells you, please, sir, you will not sit there, but I would rather the instruction is that we start sitting from this end. Now because the girl looks small, who is an usher in the house of God? You think you can defy her authority. You think she's a nobody to instruct you. Now you overrule what instructions is giving you. Already you are walking in disobedience. Because the instruction is we should be obedient. 
because the person there is not there in their own capacity she is there in the authority of god's spirit that on that day in a particular congregation people should sit in a particular manner because that's way how you were able to uh, encounter or be visited by the unction of the holy spirit sometimes the disobedience we have in our lives is so subtle that we never know we are disobeying god's word we never know we are actually disobeying even god himself but you see if we are humble then we will be able to experience god's word remember that time when this great um, army commander his name was uh, was it naman the great uh, syrian uh, general that a young girl who was a, a damsel a maid slave maid in his house just said if only my master would have known that there's a healer in jerusalem he would have gone there and be healed now he went there and when he got there the instruction from elisha was very very um uh, looked like uh, not sophisticated for his caliber and for his class of person elisha said if you go and dip yourself wash yourself in the jordan seven times you shall be made well you shall be cleansed of your leprosy now the man thought elisha should have come out and met him and greeted him with all protocol and even addressed him with all the protocol that he deserves but elisha did not even leave his house elisha only sent a messenger to him tell that naaman to go to the river jordan and dip himself in the river seven times that was instruction now when naaman was getting agitated he was getting worked up he was almost turning away to go his servant told him had he given you a difficult thing to do wouldn't you have done it now that he has just given you a simple instruction why can you obey to obey is better and you see when naaman obeyed god's instruction through his servant elisha that's how naaman received a, a new set of skin he was cleansed of all his leprosy the bible records that his skin turned as the skin of a child that means he received a skin transplant what a miracle working god we serve god operated on the man and gave him a brand new skin the man was in his 50s he got a brand new skin that he became he had a soft skin cleansed clean as though he was just a small boy now we know that this is how we engage god's power by obeying god's word but the disobedience that is always there we disobey god in so little subtle matters we need to be careful because these are the common forces of darkness that encounter or oppress or beset the believer how did you deal with the instruction given to you last time in church how did you deal with the instruction given to you by the word of god you may not be in church per se no one may be there per se but god's word has come to you and instructed you to do a particular thing you know that this thing has been a reminder to you either to give a particular seed or either to do something for god or either to commit a particular amount of money or or responsibility or to give your time to the work of god or to serve something or god has instructed you to go and help a particular sister or help a particular brother or come out of your way and see to it that you make someone comfortable in a particular place but because you think these people don't deserve you or they don't deserve your help and because you think no one else has had that instruction then you think you can just uh, slot the matter under the carpet remember when god speaks he demands that we obey because any time you disobey you are working under the domain you are working under the spirit of the kingdom of the air the spirit of the ruler of the kingdom of the air that is the spirit of the enemy the spirit of the devil and now you find he can manipulate he can control he can lure you into walking in disobedience and of course any time you walk in disobedience you are walking in defiance in god's word and there is nothing that god hates as disobedience the bible says in the book of first samuel the first samuel chapter number 15 i read chapter 15 verse number 23 verse 22 and 23 look at 22 and 23 it says but samuel replied does the lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the lord to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams look at how god thinks about disobedience it is is much better to obey than to give the biggest offering in the house of god it is much better to obey the voice of god than to be the one seen as the one doing um uh, the biggest job in the house of god than even going to preach someone says i'm going to preach 
regardless of who, uh, the consequence, who, who, uh, let them do what they may. No, it, it doesn't work like that. Even though you may go and preach, and you may lead many people to Christ, but you see, you may be doing it in disobedience, and God will regard that as sin. Remember, when God told Moses the second time, he said, Moses, you will not strike the rock this time. Speak to the rock, and it will produce water. Then Moses went ahead, out of his own frustration and anger, he struck the rock. What happened? A miracle came forth. Water gushed out of the rock, and people drank of the water, and they were um, uh, refreshed, and they were happy. But God was angry with Moses. And this sin is the sin that God, that cost Moses his destiny in Canaan. God said, because you did not give me glory before people, therefore you will not enter the land of Canaan. You will not see it. What happened to Moses? Moses performed a miracle in the name of God. Moses did a great thing in the name of God. Moses helped people. They enjoyed the blessing of God. But Moses, since he did it in disobedience, he did not obey God's word. It was counted as sin against Moses. And it actually cost him um, his entry to Canaan. He never stepped in Canaan just because of one simple uh, instruction that he neglected. He overrided. He overlooked at. He thought anything is anything. So you may go ahead and do some things, but you are doing them in disobedience. Yes, you get the results. Yes, people will be happy. Yes, you will be blessed. Yes, the church will be happy and everyone will be excited about you. In fact, they will call you mighty man of God or mighty woman of God or a great minister of the gospel or a wonderful musician or a great brother in the, in the house of God. You will be called a brother of consolation. But you are doing whatever you are doing in disobedience, in defiance in God's word. You will find that eventually God will demand of you what did you do? Because as far as God is concerned, the end does not necessarily justify the means. God is concerned about the process. He wants to see how you begin the process, how you run the race, and how you end at the end. Because the end of the matter does not justify the means of how you got there as far as God is concerned. Because what God is looking for, God is not looking for the money you bring. God is not looking for the, how much you give in his house. God is not looking for how much you can serve him. God is looking at, are you willing? Are you available? <clears throat> do you have a teachable spirit? Can you do it his way? Because he knows what he wants. Uh, look here, brothers and sisters. His name is Ancient of Days. That means he was forever in the beginning. And he will be forever in the end. That means in eternity before the beginning, he was there. And eternity after the end, he still will remain there. So there's no hurry. There's nothing that you can um, maybe uh, flabbergast him with. Or you can... Um, uh, entice him with. All he wants is do things in the way that's supposed to be done. The Bible says, and let everything be done in order and in, um, in accordance to the set down rules. Let everything done in order and according to the set down rules. That's what God wants us to do. Now, when you walk in disobedience, then verse number, number 23 of that scripture, he says, for rebellion or disobedience is like the sin of divination. And arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you. Now, you wonder, can God reject a man? Yes, he can. God can. Someone says, you see, as long as God has called me, uh, he cannot reject me. God can change his mind. The Bible says, it regretted God that he had chosen Saul to be the king of Israel. That means God, in his all wisdom, he had appointed Saul to be the king, but he says it regretted him. That means God says, ah, I wish I never appointed this man to be the king. Does it mean God never knew? No. God had known his destiny. And God had chance that because the man has his spirit and the man has the willpower, that the man will choose the right things, will choose the right path, will choose to walk the right way. But the man was full of arrogance. He was full of his selfish desires. Then he chose the opposite instead of choosing the way of God. In KJV, that scripture says, it says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. How many of God's children have been rejected by God? Now you see, but Bishop, you see, you cannot lose salvation. We cannot, uh, there's no we can lose salvation. I know that theology, and I believe it. You cannot lose salvation. But the Bible says, Jesus talking, in the book of Matthew, he says, in that day, 
there will be a choosing. He says, I shall separate the sheep from the goat. That means in the house of God, we have, although all are ruminants, they are all livestock, the sheep and the goats. But there are those who are goats. He says, I will separate the sheep from the goat. Hallelujah. Yes, everybody will come to heaven. Everyone will enter the kingdom. But inside the kingdom, they shall be the sheep and they shall be the goats. Now, I would that you be the sheep of God, the lamb of God, that will be among those who are uh, the, the be shepherded by God. The, the goats, they will be in the house, they will be in the farm, they will be in the kingdom, but their own portion is not well defined. I would that you be the sheep of God. You be willing, you be easily led, you be easily given and yielded to the instruction of God. That's what God desires of us. When you look at disobedience in itself, actually disobedience disconnected man from God, right in the, from the Garden of Eden. It is disobedience that disconnected man from the glory of God, right from the Garden of Eden. Now like here, you see King Saul has lost his kingdom, not because he did anything. And for goodness sake, when you look at Saul's um, CV, Saul is a man that was um, up to date. He was a righteous man. He was a right standing man. A man that had moral standards. A man that was upright morally. Saul was a man that had it all going. He had every system in place. He looked well before people. He minded his opinion or public opinion. He minded how people looked at him. So he had a, a proper public image. Fantastic public, public image. A good PR stand. Public relations was good. But because he disobeyed God and did what God never wanted him to do. The Bible says God rejected him as king. Now, in the book of Romans chapter 3, verse number 23, the famous scripture, uh, famous scripture that many people uh, read and we remain there. Actually, it confirms something. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Hallelujah. Many, all of us, all humanity, sinned and came short or fell short of the glory of God. But Christ has come so that we may become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we no longer need to walk in defiance of God's word. We no longer need to walk in defiance of God's rules. In, we no longer need to walk in disobedience. Rather, we should walk in obedience of God's word and enjoy the blessing of the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, the spirit of disobedience, one of the areas that we see it manifesting, I say it is so sublimal, so subtle that you may never know it is there. One of the areas you see it manifesting, it manifests a lot in um, what you call arguments and negotiations to instructions. The word of God says do this or don't do this, but you always want to find an argument around it. You always want to uh, negotiate the instructions. See, sometimes is what the word of God is outrightly clear that this is what God does not want. God is not pleased when you do this. Don't try to negotiate around it. Learn and train yourself just to obey God's word. Just to take it as it is. And you find that there's a blessing in there. Now, one of the areas that uh, the devil has really had God's children within his uh, ambits is the area of obeying God's word. Satan has really enticed God's children to take the word of God with levity. Now, it makes you, devil makes you think of the word of God as just one of those writings or one of those instructions that you may as well not necessarily follow, but uh, nothing much will really happen. So, be careful. When you find that the word of God has started becoming levity for you, in other words, it's light. You take it for granted. You don't really take it seriously. Just be conscious that you may be walking, you're bordering, Walking and living in disobedience. And of course you know disobedience. The consequence is. Will always set you in separation. Will disconnect you from the glory of God. When the devil went to Jesus. And tried to make him. Or tried to negotiate God's word with Jesus. He tried to negotiate God's instruction with Jesus. Remember as he was trying to throw it to him this. It is written. You remember that? It is written. It is written. It's written, I will make this bread for you if you are the son of God. It's written, uh, the stone will be turned to bread. Jesus said, don't tempt God. Then he says, it is written, even if you throw yourself from the uh, peak of the tabernacle, um, he will not allow your feet to dash on any rock. 
or any stone. Jesus said, it is written, don't tempt the Lord your God. Now, Jesus knew that the enemy was a clever guy. He was cleverly trying to make him negotiate on God's instruction, on God's word, so that he may find himself in disobedience negotiatingly. Now, this is an area that we must be careful as God's children. What are the sins that the enemy is trying to negotiate you into? What are those things that the devil has really made them so casual and usual and ordinary in your life that eventually you have found yourself now, you are literally living in sin. You are living in disobedience, but it's like conscience is seared. You are no longer being pricked by your conscience. Please, brothers and sisters, be awakened and wake up to the word of God. Wake up to the truth of God's word. Stay away from sin, especially the sin that entangles so easily. Because living in sin is living in disobedience. And of course, disobedience disconnects man from God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, you as a child of God, you must stand your ground. You must stand your ground. Jesus stood his ground. He had filled himself with the word of God. And he countered all the temptation of the devil by refusing to obey or let the devil make him negotiate God's word or negotiate the instructions. But he stood by the word of God and Jesus overcame the temptation. Also, Joseph, when he was being tempted by the, uh, the woman, uh, that Potiphar's wives, Joseph said, how can I disobey God by doing this? How can I disobey God? So Joseph refused to disobey God. He stuck to God's word and refused to follow the whims, the pressure of the day, but stood by God's word. And thereby Joseph overcame the temptation. God also expects you today to walk in righteousness, to walk in the victory um, of the faith in Christ Jesus. We all are victors. We all are more than conquerors. You have the ability in you to overrule and to override any temptation coming your way, any challenge coming to you. You have all the power because Jesus empowers you. Yes, for it is Christ that lives in me that is doing the work. It's God in you. Christ in you, your hope of glory. So long as your strength is by Christ. So your obedience is not the work of the flesh. It's the work of the spirit of God. The spirit of obedience is at work in you. Glory to God. Now the second force of darkness that um, battles or the believers are battling, the force of the lying spirit, the spirit of lies. This is a spirit that is so rampant among believers and is so, you know, is so cunning. It doesn't come to you head on. It creeps to you from your back. Before you know it, you are also uh, affected or affected by the lying spirit. Now, the lying spirit does not necessarily come as a lie. It just comes as a, an alteration to the truth. Either it allows you to speak the truth, but you exaggerate, plus something else. Now, when you speak the truth, plus something, you have spoken a lie. When you speak a truth, but you remove some facts from the truth, you still have spoken a lie. Because a lie is not necessarily the opposite of the truth. Actually, a lie is not the opposite of a truth. A lie is an exaggerated truth or a subtracted truth. In other words, a truth tempered with is a lie. A half-truth is a whole lie. Hallelujah. That's how it is. When you speak a half-truth, you have spoken a full lie. So you must know the force of the lying spirit is a force that is so much over the children, the life of a believer, that a, every believer must be alert. Hallelujah. One of the things that you must know is that people do not do evil because they want to, but because of their submission to this spirit of lies. Most people just find themselves doing evil or falling in evil traps, not because they want to. Actually, in their heart of hearts, they don't want to, but there's a lying spirit that lures them into it. And before they know it, they find that they are so deep into it. Now, some of them are ashamed even to come out of it. Or some of them, because they have gone so far, they then just learn to live with a lie. Now, this, I say, is not to the exemption of the, even the clergy, the minister of the gospel. Do not be surprised even when uh, you see prophets of God lying or uh, men of God, uh, pastors, bishops, you see them speaking lie. Don't judge them. Don't be quick to say uh, everyone is a liar. No, not everyone is a liar. But everyone is battling 
the force of the lying spirit. Everyone is battling it. Now it takes us to be spiritually alert to know when the spirit of lying or the lying spirit is at work. You need to be very, very alert. Now, we need to know that this lying spirit, as I said, it does not attack. It actually entices you into it. The Bible says in the book of um, First Kings, chapter 22. I want to read verse number 21 and 22. So that we may know the force of the lying spirit is not just speaking lies, but actually is a spiritual force that controls people, that attacks people, that dominates people. Is actually a spiritual force. It's a demonic activity that may come over a congregation, may come over a family, may come over an individual. You find that there's a brother who has now all of a sudden becomes just a liar. There's nothing they say there's a truth. You see him coming from this side. When you ask him, brother, are you coming from this side? He says, no, 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 I'm coming from this side. And yet his back is facing that side. That means he's coming from this side. But he just has to speak a lie. They call them the pathological liars. That is psychology. But we know it's not just psychological description. We can look at it as it's a spiritual problem. There's a force behind that. And this force, as I said, you may find Christians who are still battling it. Most of us, when you are making phone calls, just check on how you made your last phone call. In every five conversations you make, you find that three out of five, you had included lies every single day. Three out of five, actually, let me put it down. Two out of three conversations you make on a phone, you find that two out of the three conversations, two out of them, you find that you spoke a lie. You lied of your destination. You lied about your exact location. You lied about your time. You lied about what you are doing. Just because the other person is not seeing you, you eventually spoke a lie. You twisted truth. You twisted the facts because of where you are. You may not have meant bad or meant evil, but you see that you altered the truth. You spoke a lie. And I find that this spirit now dominates people. The Bible says in the book of First Kings chapter 22, verse number 21, it says, finally, a spirit came forward. You see, a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. I will entice him. God is holy. In him there is no iniquity. There is no darkness. But now there was a time, there was a king of Israel who was an, a wicked king and God was tired of his uh, iniquity. And now in heaven it was us who would go down there and entice this man to his self-destruction. A spirit stepped forward. That means a demon spirit. Because in God there is no lies. God does not lie. But an evil spirit stood before God. And of course it said, I will go and entice him. Now, someone will say, uh, does it mean that uh, God can allow a demon to come to a man? Yes, God can allow. He is supreme. The Bible says, as he allowed the devil to speak to him about Job, and God allowed the devil to go and touch Job. So also, he still does the same. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He is the same. He is the same God. He doesn't change. He has power over all spirits. He is the father of all spirits. Now, in verse 22, the word of God says, says, by what means, the Lord asked, I will go out, the spirit said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. He said, you will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. Now you see, the spirit, an evil spirit, came under God's instruction or was allowed to come to the mouth of the prophets and speak a lie. So I said, you may find sometimes a prophet speaking a lie or prophesying what is not there or a man of God speaking a lie or a pastor speaking a lie. Don't be too quick to judge. Just watch out, step back, and the best thing you can do as a believer is to pray. Because you may be under attack. When the spirit of lying has entered a man of God, when the spirit of lying has entered a prophet, it means the entire nation is at a danger. They are being lured into a destruction. Because people will follow what the prophet will say, and they may end up into destruction. That means an evil spirit is out rampaging or planning to bring destruction to our people. So every time we see this in a family, especially to those who are heads of family, you see to those who are heads of family, either the parents, either the man, or the head of the family, the husband, or the pastor, or the leader of a group, or the leader of a nation, or a politician who is a leader, maybe a member of parliament, you find that he's so lying, 
your area uh, member of uh, county assembly is so lying you just find that now that means you need to pray for that man because it means that the enemy has had your region or your zone under his radar and he wants to destroy the lives of people there so the best thing you can do is to pray the consequences of the spirit of lies one of the things is that when a spirit of lies has come it cuts people from communion with the lord it comes to distract people cut people from communion with the lord that's one of the major consequences of um, the lying spirit when there are lies among the brethren when there are lies in a family when there are lies in a union when there are lies in a fellowship when there are lies in an organization in a team you find that the communion not be good because when the lying spirit comes it cuts people from communion with the lord the bible says in the book of psalm psalm 101 verse number 7 and 8 i'm reading psalm 101 verse number 7 and verse number 8 he says, no one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Are you seeing that? Anytime you start speaking falsely or falsehood, you are distracted. You are just excommunicated from God's house. There are many people that God just... Ex- and you see, when God starts pushing people out of his house, they may not know they are being pushed out. When God shifts from people, they may not know. They may have everything just going on the way it was. But they don't know that God has moved. God has departed. The Spirit of God is so, um, uh, so gentle that you must be wise and you must be so, so uh, spiritual and spiritually alight to know that you are walking in steps with him. In verse number 8, he says, Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. Now he says, how do I do that? No man that speaks deceit And no one who walks in falsehood shall stand in the house of God. God has shown about that. So, lying disconnects people from communion with the Lord. I don't know how you have lived your life. Could there be some lies in your life? Now that you don't pray as you used to pray, could you be lying somewhere? Now that you are not enjoying the flow of the Spirit as you used to be, could you be hiding some lies? Could there be some deception somewhere in your life? Those things as the Spirit of God is speaking to you, Please get rid of them. Remove them from your life. Cleanse yourself from it and come back to the fellowship of the beloved. Hallelujah. Now, how can we live perfectly with the Lord? After knowing these two major common uh, forces of darkness that hinder the believers or contend with the believers, how can we overcome them and live victoriously with the Lord? Number one, we must sincerely desire a godly life. Number one way so that To overcome these two forces of darkness. There are a few ways that are put down here. But the first one is that you must sincerely desire a godly life. Desire to live a godly life. Now, being born again is one thing. But being godly is another thing. Being born again is just calling on the name of the Lord and you're born. You're born again. You become the child of God. But now from there, you ought now to start living a godly life. As a child of God, you must now start producing the works of godliness because now you are godly. The Bible says in the book of uh, Matthew, chapter number 5 and verse number 6, look at it in the Beatitudes of Christ. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Do you desire, do you hunger for righteousness? You must cultivate that hunger for righteousness. You must have that burning desire to live a righteous life, to live a holy life. You must desire to live a godly life. Yes, that's how it should be. How do you sincerely desire to live a godly life? Number A, you must crave for holiness. You must have a craving for holiness. Cultivate that desire. Cultivate that urge. Cultivate that thirst for holiness. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yes, you must crave for holiness. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse number 4, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. You must cultivate, you must crave for holiness because through that spirit of holiness, Jesus was declared to be the son of God. And through that spirit of holiness, you will be declared 
to be a son of God. You live a righteous life. You live a holy life. You live a godly life. Yes. Number two, or point number B, you must pray to be endowed with the spirit of obedience. Now, after praying, after craving for, the, uh, for holiness, you must pray to be endowed with the spirit of obedience. Now, as I'm saying that, you must know, as the Bible has told us uh, first, in the book of um, Romans chapter 1, verse number 4, it says, And who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, we see that it was not just because Jesus was declared. There's something he did. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 7 and uh, to 10, he tells us about something. Jesus cried and he prayed to have this spirit of holiness. The Bible says during the, his days, the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from the death. And he was hard because of his reverent submission. Are you seeing that? He was hard because of his reverent submission. In verse number 8, the word of God says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Are you seeing this? Jesus craved for holiness. Jesus craved for that spirit of holiness. He craved for it, although he was a son. But he learned obedience from what he suffered. When he went through the humanity, when he faced the limitations and depravity of man, which he had because he was 100% a man, he craved for holiness. He prayed for that spirit. He prayed to him who would save him. In verse number 9, the word of God says, And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Are you seeing that? Yes, Jesus cried. Jesus prayed for the spirit of holiness. So we must crave for the spirit of holiness. We must crave for holiness. Crave to, have, to live a holy life. Crave for it. Pray for it. De- cry for it. Push yourself into it. It's something that you must do deliberately. Yes, you must le- do it deliberately. Verse number 10. The word of God says, uh, Hallelujah. It says, and he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus was, became the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, having said that, then Jesus prayed to be, to be filled by this spirit of holiness. You too, you need to pray and crave for holiness. Jesus prayed for it, he got it. You pray for it, you get it. I said, pray also to be endowed with the spirit of obedience. Pray to be endowed by the spirit of obedience. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 36, Verse 26 and 27. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Hallelujah. I think the Lord will do it. So pray to be led to have the spirit of obedience. Ask God to give it to you. You find that you are, it's difficult for you to obey instructions. Ask God to make you obedient. Just ask God to remove from me the spirit of disobedience. Some of us are arrogant. We were born naturally defiant. We always disobey instruction. No, ask God. Don't say that this is how I was born. He was not born that way. He's a demon that entered you, that has made you defiant instruction. Now you are leading your life into destruction. Pray that the spirit of God will fill you, or God will fill you with the heart of obedience, with the spirit of obedience, that from now henceforth, you'll be an obedient child. He calls us his obedient children. Why? We have the heart of flesh. He has removed from us the heart of stone. Now from out of you shall be uprooted that heart of stone. That spirit that rejects instruction shall be removed from you in the name of Jesus Christ. Pray to God that it should be done to you. And from now henceforth, you start enjoying the free grace, the flow of the anointing of God in your life. Hallelujah. Now point number two, how do you overcome these two common forces of darkness that oppress or um, uh, entangle the believer. Number two, cultivate a godly life. Hallelujah. Cultivate a godly life. You must cultivate. Now, the first point was we must sincerely desire a godly life. Number two, you must cultivate a godly life in you. Now, Holiness is an exercise that we must undertake as a person. For us to live this godly life is a life of holiness. And holiness here is an exercise that we must undertake. 
it is not God who is going to make us holy, but we must rid ourselves of all the evil vices and cultivate in us the godly life, the holy life. It's something, it's an exercise that we must undertake. The Bible says in the book of First Peter, chapter number 1, verse number 15 and 16, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. God would not have told us to be holy if he knew it was impossible. So it is possible for us to live holy. It is possible for a human being to be a holy person. So he says, be holy in all that you do. In everything, in all your engagements. He says, be holy. In verse number 16. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So it means the ability to be holy is already the believer. You already have that ability. So don't say, you see, I've been trying to live a born again life. I've been trying to live a holy life, but it's impossible. I want to go. No, no, it says cultivate. Cultivate. Practice being holy. Practice it. Try it. Work on it. Practice it being, being holy. You shall be holy. Hallelujah. Yes, it's very important. Uh, there are things that when we are practicing to be holy, there's something that you will do. There are a few things that you must do. There are things that we must put off and some of them we must put on. Hallelujah. There are things that we must put off when you are cultivating to be a God, to live a godly life, there are things that in us we must rid of them. We must cut them out. And there are those things that we must deliberately bring in us. Purpose to bring them in us. There is someone who you find that you are battling with the spirit of anger. You have anger. You have issues with the anger. Now you proudly say, I'm an angry man. You see, my anger does not allow me that. And because I quickly get angry, so I avoid people. No, you are glorifying demons. Because anger is not of God. Go, anger is not of God. People who throw tantrums, people who have quickly uh, vexed into anger, they're not godly. The Bible says a foolish man is quickly angered. Now, and he shows off his anger. Don't glorify evil things. Put them off. Read them out. You're a new creation now. There are some vices in you, like some of us are stingy people. You just cannot part with your money. You just cannot help other people. You never feel remorse to help other people. And you say, no, 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 that's how I am. No, that's not how you were. That's how the devil has manipulated you into being. So you must read off that attitude of stinginess. You must read off at that attitude of selfishness and become generous because that's the will of God. That's the attitude of God. That's the character of God. You are God's child. God is a giver. You must become a giver. And you start from where you are. Yes, in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the book of Colossians, chapter number 3, I'll read verse number 8 to 10. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Verse number 8 to 10. What the word of God says? There are things that we must read off. Cut them out of us. And there are, things, there are things that we shall deliberately put them in our lives. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 3 verse number 8. It says, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as this. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. You cannot just be talking anyhow. You cannot just be... You know, those are things that he tells us. Those are ungodly things. Those are things that are done by unholy people. So he says, anger, you must get out of it. Rage, fits of rage, anger that must break things. He says, that's a demon. Those are demonic characteristics in you. He says, get rid of them. Remove them from you. Just allow them to go. He says, malice. Sometimes we speak, we claim we are speaking the truth, but you are maliciously revealing things. Not because you want to edify, but you know you want to use the fact that you have about other people to reveal them so that you may break them. Whatever you do, you do with malice. He says, get rid of it. Malice, slander, slandering other people. He says, and filthy language from your lips. Obscene language. You speak vulgar. He says, get rid of it. It's unholy. It's ungodly. Yes, there are you know, like you want to talk about things, you want to refer to, you want to have a discussion. You don't have to be cursing in your language. Especially those of us who have gone to school uh, and uh, some of you who have traveled or you have relatives who are in, uh, as, uh, let's say in America, especially in America. You have relatives who are there or you are aspiring to go to America. You have the dream to go to America. Now, because you spoke to your auntie in America and they were cursing in their language, so you also are using the F word, yet you are born again. You are cursing, you are, you are calling names. You now start calling people names. Look here, you are only allowing demons in your life. Get rid of it. The Bible says, get rid of it. Cultivate godliness in you. 
cultivate that attitude in you. Get rid of filthy language from your lips. In verse number 9, do not lie to each other. That means from tonight, stop lying. You will not speak lies again in the name of Jesus Christ. Even on your phone. It doesn't matter how it is. Just try to speak the truth. Speak the facts. Speak the truth as it is. Just speak the truth. Speak God's word. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices, since now you're born again, the old man is gone. You are a new creation. Then verse number 10, he says, we must put on the new man. Consciously do it. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of his creator. Now, the knowledge, the image of his creator. Who is the creator of you? You are now being born again. Or not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed, which is the word of God. Who is your creator therefore? The word of God. So you are being renewed day by day into the image of the word of God. And we know the word of God is God. So you are being regenerated. You are being recreated. You are being renewed, remodeled into the image of God. Hallelujah. You are becoming a God man in Jesus' name. Glory to God. That's very important. So cultivate holiness. Cultivate godliness in your life. Point number three. Follow after righteousness. Pursue righteousness. At all costs, pursue righteousness. There's no amount of prize. There's nothing that you can compare as our pursuit of righteousness or living righteous. Follow righteousness. Pursue righteousness. Choose the righteous way. There are many options out there, but please find yourself in the narrow path, the path of righteousness. Pursue righteousness. In all that you do, in whatever you do, please pursue righteousness. The Bible says in the book of um, Isaiah, chapter 51, verse number 1 and 2, it says, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you are cut and the quarry from which you are hewn. Verse number 2, he says, Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I called him, he was but one, and I blessed him and made him many. He says, let's follow the example of Abraham, who believed God against hope. In all hopeless situation, against the hopelessness of the world, he says, Abraham believed God, that, and he trusted God. So pursue God, pursue righteousness, pursue the word of God, stick there, and hang in there. Hallelujah. Look at Abraham. Look at the rock which was your own. You came from him. You who pursue righteousness, look after that rock. He set an example to us. He says, and Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. That's where we are going. In the book of Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 10 and 12. The oracle says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. Are you seeing that? Those who pursue righteousness should beware of this. The love of money is the root cause of all evil. So when you pursue righteousness, you should know, lest you be carried away by the love of money. He didn't say money. He says the love of money. So don't pursue the love of money. Let the lust of money, the lust of the flesh, let it not carry you off. Verse number 11. He says... But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. He says, pursue those things. Flee from the love of money and pursue righteousness, pursue godliness, pursue love, pursue endurance, and pursue gentleness. Try at all costs. This should be your focus. This should be your day-to-day -day engagement. This is where your energy should be. On a daily basis. In verse number 12, he says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Hallelujah. Fight the good fight of faith by pursuing righteousness. That's how we fight the fight of faith. By following, pursuing love, pursuing gentleness. Very important. So pursue righteousness. Now, in point number four, I'll say, engage the power of the blood of Jesus. Engage the power of the blood of Jesus. We are talking about overcoming the two common forces that entangle believers. That's the spirit of disobedience and the spirit of the force of the spirit of lying or lies. It says, engage the power of the blood of Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter number 12, verse number 11, a very famous scripture. It says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his, their testimony. They did not love their lives so much 
as to shrink from death. Hallelujah. He says, when you want to overcome, you need to engage the mystery of the blood of Jesus. You must engage. The blood of Jesus is not just the blood of a man was, that was shed in Calvary or somewhere in Golgotha. No, there's a mystery in the blood. There's power in the blood of Jesus. And that power is power enough to remit us from all sins. To cleanse us from all manner of unrighteousness. So you are battling these things in your life. You find that these things are entangling you. Please engage the mystery of the blood of Jesus. Engage it. Just call on the blood of Jesus. Say, I am cleansed by the blood of Jesus. I have remission of sins by the blood of Jesus. Very important. For the Bible says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamp and the word of their testimony. What's your testimony? I am the righteousness of God. I speak truthfulness. I speak truths. I am an obedient child. That's your testimony. You confess with God what he has made you to be. You are born righteous. You are the righteousness of God. Therefore, in you there is no darkness. Because you are being renewed into the image of him who created you. Hallelujah. Then in, in the book of Zechariah, chapter number 9, verse number 10 and 11, we are talking about engaging the mystery of the blood of Jesus. When you want to subdue, overcome these two forces of darkness that besets the believer, what you do, you engage the mystery of the blood of the Lamb. It says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bar will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. Hallelujah. Are you seeing that? He says, I will remove the chariots of Ephraim and the war horses from Israel and the battle bar will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. Hallelujah. He will bring tranquility. He will bring an end to all your battles. How? His rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. He's not talking about just Jerusalem itself, a physical Jerusalem, but he's talking about the spiritual life of a believer. That the rule of the, the word of God, the rule of the Lord will be over your life. Now in verse number 11, he now comes home. Look at verse number 11. Number 11 he says, As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Are you seeing that? Because of the blood, the rule of the lamp, the rule of the prince of peace, the rule that will extend over all, that rule over all dominion, over anything, over all the battles that you've been facing. He says, I will destroy the chariots, I will remove the battle axe. That means there will be peace in your life when you engage the mystery of the blood of the covenant. What is the blood of the covenant for you? Is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the blood of the covenant that speaks better things than the blood of Abraham. It's a better covenant than that was sealed by the blood of bulls and goats. We are in the covenant of the blood of Jesus. Amen? So engage the mystery of the blood of the Lamb in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Now finally, point number five. Take daily baths of the word of God. In other words, have a daily bath in the word of God. Have a daily bath in the word of God. On a daily basis, bath in the word of God. In other words, soak yourself in the word of God. That's how you overcome this force of darkness that beset believers, that entangle believers. Just take a bath in the word of God. The Bible says, God's word is the cleansing agency. As the word of God tells us in the book of um, Acts chapter 20, verse number 32, it says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Now, God's word is the only cleansing agent that is sure to clean you from all manner of unrighteousness. It's only the word of God. So when you want to live a holy life, when you want to walk in holiness and cultivate, um, uh, live, uh, create this atmosphere whereby you are free from the dominion and domain of this uh, force of darkness that beset believers, you must take daily baths of the word of God. Now, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, verse number 9 to 11, look at that. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. Are you seeing that? You want to live a pure life? It says, by living according to your word, the word of God. When you live according to the word of God, you live a pure life. Then verse number 10, it says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. The psalmist knew. The commands of the Lord is what 
will sustain him. So it is what keeps a man pure. It what make, keeps you in the holiness, the commands of the Lord. Then verse number 11, he finishes by saying, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. I have hidden the word of God in my heart. Hide the word of God in your heart. Then you find that you are always living a holy life. You are living a pure life. The word of God will keep you, will preserve you, will sustain you in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. So, this is very important. The word of God will cleanse you. Cleanse you. Now, when you are living a good life, after you cultivate and live and are able to start living in godliness or living a godly life, you find that you are always victorious because godliness will make you bold and will give you a fresh anointing every day. You want to live a fresh life. Every day you're excited. Every day you're looking forward for a great time. It's only when you now start living godly. Because when you live godly, godliness will make you bold and will give you every day a fresh anointing. The word of God says in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 1, verse 23, the word of God will make you bold. Holiness will make you bold. And will make you start have a fresh anointing every day. In other words, there will be no stale anointing for you. There will be no bad day for you. There will be no difficult day for you. Every day will be a new grace. A new day. A fresh day uh, you will be looking forward to. Now you will never have a, a better yesterday. All through your life. Because every day you have a fresh bath. A fresh anointing. And you are bold in your walk of faith. Yes, godliness will make you bold. Now the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 1 verse 23, it says, if you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. Hallelujah. You see that? It says, if you had responded to my rebuke, that means if you respond to my rebuke, then I will pour out my heart to you and I will make my thoughts known to you. Are you seeing that? When you follow God's word, when you live a godly life, you are always fresh in the morning. God is always freshening you. God is always cleansing you. God is making his thoughts known to you. So you are never in a confusion. You are never in a straight betwixt. You are never in a crossroad. Always you know what to do, how to do what you are supposed to do, when exactly you are supposed to do what you are supposed to do. Because the Spirit of God now guides you and leads you. Living in the Word of God. Living a holy life. Overcoming the two most common forces of darkness that beset the believer. I don't know how your life is today, but I know one thing, that you desire to live a godly life. You desire to have a victorious life. You desire to walk in the path of righteousness. And I want to pray with you now. Yes, the power of God is present here. The Spirit of God is ready to minister to you. Right now as I'm praying, I just want you to, um, in faith, join me in prayer as we pray this prayer together in Jesus' name. Let's pray right now. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you for my believers uh, for your children, uh, my viewers, the believers who are watching me right now, and even those who are not believing, but they are yet believing, but they are watching right now. I pray right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, according to your word, that Father, may you minister to them. May you touch them at the point of their needs. May you bless them, Father. May you refresh them right now. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, cleanse them from all manner of unrighteousness and anything that has beset them, Father, anything holding them down, anything oppressing them, Father, I pray that they will be set free They'll be delivered, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Cleanse them, Lord. Wash them right now by your precious blood, Father. Cleanse them, Father. Yes, in Jesus' name. And give them a fresh lease, a new dawn. Yes, a new beginning. That, Father, they will enjoy the freshness and the boldness we have in godliness. And also, Father, you anoint them afresh. Yes, give them a fresh anointing. A fresh anointing. Anointing for beauty. Anointing for greatness. Anointing, Father, that will draw and attract uh, uh, prosperity, good health, abundance. Yes, in the name of Jesus, the fragrance of heaven that comes upon them, Lord. Father, attract all the good things to them in the name of Jesus. Expelling all man of darkness. Expelling anything of the evil one. Expelling every spirit of rejection in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the fresh unction. Yes, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father. We bless you. Thank you for the anointing, Master. We praise your name, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.